Uh, hi, I am Alex Hirsch, uh, the creator of Gravity Falls. Hey, I'm Mike Randa. I was the creative director on the show. And uh, <laughs> and here we get to see the le- level of Durland's intelligence <laughs> on, on full display. We always loved having them be like like l- like little kid friends. They they went to sleepovers together. They solved mazes together. They're just two innocent chaps. It it gradually evolved into more, but that was that wasn't our original intention. It was just like sleepover kids. Yeah. Um, but sometimes romance blossoms. <laughs> um, so, so land before swine. Um, this was an episode we were having a really hard time uh, with an, a couple of episodes that weren't working for us. Um, yeah. We had an episode we were working on that was a camping story. Where uh, yeah. remember the camping yeah. episode where it was going to be. We just figured, like, it's a family in the Pacific Northwest. We haven't done a camping mm-hmm. episode. It seems like a no-brainer. And we try to figure out a story for these characters on a camping trip and a, and a proper monster. There was going to mm-hmm. be this, this sort of ghost hunter, like a headless horseman hunter who hunts humans. Yeah. Um, and he's got a bunch of heads on his wall. And we got a n- bunch of notes back that it was too scary. Yeah. And also, the story didn't really work. Yeah. It was like sort of Stan is trying to teach kids about roughing it. And the kids, are they're not used to roughing it. They're used to modern conveniences. And it seemed like this sort of hacky, like old versus young that yeah. wasn't specific to our characters. And so, you know, we got a few drafts in that episode. And then... We had to throw it out. Yeah. Um, and we had another episode so, that was going to be a road trip episode. Yeah. Uh, about basically the family goes on a road trip and they get caught on this endless infinity road. Yeah. And they fi- they wind up in like this diner with all these people that have been trapped on this road throughout history. Yeah. And it's just a- sort of a Groundhog's Day kind of thing. Yeah. And there was, a, there was a ton of cool ideas in both, but they just didn't gel into like full 22 minute episodes. Yeah. Well, it's like each Gravity Falls episode. You need the character story and you need the satisfying monster. And in both of yeah. those, we had either a location or a monster, but the character stories never came together. And this was something where we were down to the wire and it was like, okay, we just threw out two scripts. We need a story now. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember uh, me and uh, Mike, we, we were working out back then, right? We were working out of the Disney gym. No, this is just you, man. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't think I was working. Oh yeah, we were, we we're doing yeah. P90X. Yeah. Mike, Mike, was trying, to, Mike was trying to, Mike was trying to convince me to work out at the Disney gym because we were like, we were basically living. We were like Bert and Ernie at this yeah. point. Like we didn't see our friends. We had no social lives. It was just like every morning, like wake up in our office. Hi Mike. Hi, uh, hi Alex. Be- back to work. Hey, want to become workout buddy? Let's just, let's just cross every threshold and just become morph into one. And uh, I remember I, the reason I remember that is because the first time we worked out, I threw up. Yeah. Um, and so, but I remember I was in the shower. It was we had had a writers meeting. I, I worked out, didn't have time to shower. Went to a writers meeting, realized these stories were broken. Went back, showered, and in the shower, I came up with the broad contours of this episode because <laughs> I remember being like, I remember like the warm water hitting my face and being like. Oh, I think that'll work. I think that'll work. Um, <laughs> well, and and that was like I I remember that being a godsend because it was always like we always like took so long to break them, and then you pitched the story, and I was like, that wait, that just works. It just works. It works. <laughs> we, we can just write this. We like dinosaurs. Great. <laughs> well, this came from I had always, um, you know, I love. I, as a kid, I was obsessed with dinosaurs. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I I remember. I, when I was like in third grade, I would dig in the sand lot hoping to find a dinosaur bone. And, <laughs> and one day, I miraculously, but also like uh, in an unsanitary manner, I found a giant slice of cow femur hidden. Oh. It was inside our, because I dug through the sandbox into the dirt underneath the sandbox, and I found a bone. And this was like, I was probably like, I don't know, seven or something. Uh-huh. Like Jurassic Park was like probably on. I was, I was, I was like, I found a dinosaur bone. Right, and then like my mom was like, "You found a cow bone. This is disgusting. Like Your animals mom have been chewing is a on dream this." Dream shatter. <laughs> she should have just told me hey, like, "Yeah, Kasky, that's let a him have a little magic in his life." That's a T Rex, but you know, Kasky's Jurassic a Park, great woman. <laughs> <laughs> I was obsessed with dinosaurs. I was like, pterodactyls and plesiosaurs are probably my two favorite dinosaurs. I want to do a pterodactyl episode, um, and. <laughs> <laughs> this is Justin Roiland like going insane, and it was the best. <laughs> Just uh, Bobby Renzabi is the one of our writers, Rob Renzetti, one of our producers. Um, we we love Rob. He likes to bust our chops, so we bust yeah. his back. Uh, one of our storyboard artists, 
Uh, Eric Fountain had a phrase about Rob Renzetti, uh, which is, hey, Renzetta about it. <laughs> and also, Bobby Renzabi was a nickname for Robert Renzetti, which yeah. became this idea for this um, infomercial guy. Yeah, we were like slap happy in the editorial room, like, Bobby Renzabi. <laughs> and he's like, all right, all right, guys, guys, it's, it's, it's 1030. Do, does this need another joke? And it's like, it's not funny enough yet. <laughs> uh, Justin Roiland was great as Bobby Renzabi. Um, uh, him screaming, feel your pig's heartbeat next to yours. That's a Mike. I'm pretty sure you wrote that line, right? Uh, feel pig's know. heartbeat next to yours. Maybe. That couldn't have been me. That Maybe. has to be you. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I, I like it works, it works for, it's like w when he was screaming, it works for pigs. It's like, can you scream the word pigs longer? And he's like, yes, I can. <laughs> um, this is, I actually think that we might have done some of these. He was on Gravity Falls before he was on Adventure Time as Lemon Grab. Yeah. Um, and before Rick and Morty. So it was like, I was like, he's ours. We, <laughs> we know he can scream. No one else knows this. And then, of course, you know. You were on the, you were on the Justin Roiland ground floor. Huge, he's a huge star now. What a rip off. Um, yeah, that's a character of Alonzo in the background. Uh, that guy with the <laughs> lips. Uh, one of our, one of our st uh, standard, uh, our star bo uh, storyboard artists. And well, what, one one thing th this episode was great because it 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 came together so easily. Like unlike some of the other ones, it was like a total joy to write, and it, especially because the stakes were so clear. It was like everyone loves Mabel, everyone loves Mabel's pig. So and and one of the things we try to do in the episodes is like have these moments where you remind the audience like the value of these characters' relationships. So in the beginning of the episode, we see Seuss and Dipper having a good time together. So we remember like oh their friendship's important. We see Mabel and Pig, uh, Mabel and Waddles having their dance party together and it makes you like both see and feel in your heart how important these relationships are so then when they're threatened later in the episodes you actually care about it like that's the number one thing about these episodes like can you get an audience of of uncaring just bored you know people flipping through the tv to actually care about these characters to and become these situations? invested yeah and it's i think the there was this idea that i had had I think back to the beginning of the series when I first came up with it that there's from Jurassic Park there's that idea of the mosquito and sap and what if you yeah. could fit an entire dinosaur and sap in a yeah. town like Gravity Falls I believe there's di entire dinosaurs and sap that could be thought out and so I sort of thought out that all idea for this um, and then was like can we make this a Mabel Stan episode can this idea about Mabel's relationship with Waddles actually reveal a rift between Mabel and Stan where Mabel and Stan actually get along pretty well in the yeah. series you know they, when they they're both such strong, stubborn personalities that yeah. when they conflict, they conflict hard, like in Boss Mabel. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea that Waddles is sort of a metaphor for what Mabel loves, and Stan loves Mabel, but he doesn't, he doesn't really think that anything she thinks is necessarily smart or right. You know, he loves her like, ah, oh, he's my, she's my sweet niece, but yeah, she doesn't know anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, yeah, she doesn't know anything about a pig. <laughs> um, and this, uh, you know, a lot of sitcom storytelling is based on lies or miscommunication, and this. What made this episode work was the lie, mm -hmm. was that he puts the pig out, it's his fault, he lies about it, and that gives us something to discover so we have a second act break. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and especially the, the lie was so uh, beautifully rendered. <laughs> this line, tenderly nursing him with only the richest of creams, I would have cut it, but it always made you laugh. See, it made you laugh again. The richest of creams. <laughs> So it's one of those things that's like not in the script, but I said in, in the room because it just seemed like Stan's laying it on thick, like, you know, the sun was golden <laughs> by, by the velvet touch of the big, soft baby cheek. Creams. Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's making me laugh right now. <laughs> Uh, the tattoo on Stan's back is the word lies in code. We didn't want to reveal what his actual tattoo was. Oh, so there's yeah. a fake tattoo there for eagle eyed fans. Um, nice acting on Stan where he looks through his pinky to see if his lie worked. Yeah, that and this, is nice acting. This is kind of a good tee-up for where we're going in season three is like Mabel's very trusting. She's willing to season trust two. Stan. Or season two, yeah. She's very trusting. She's willing to trust Stan. And we love it. It was, it, it was also like it was such a delight to get like the designs back and stuff and see the the crazy, not the designs, but just the 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 designs and the background and stuff like the the amazing paintings of the like t-rex is caught in amber and stuff it was like mind-blowing when we saw this stuff come yeah back. i gotta give um josh parpan one of our background painters he was sort of the master of these all the t-rexes underground he did a great job yeah he's um, obsessed with jurassic park he is obsessed <laughs> with jurassic park like he talks about Jurassic Park daily. His first crush was Laura Dern. We're just talking about Josh Parpin right now. He's like one of our best artists. We're, we're good friends. Head there. <laughs> wow. 
Mabel, we've got to talk. This is a really high-stakes mission, and I'm a little worried about Seuss coming along on this one. I love the guy, but sometimes he messes stuff up. What? Since when? Sorry, dude. Sorry, dude. Look, a fairy! <laughs> Oh, sorry, dude. This sequence with Seuss splatting the fairy, <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was too far. <laughs> and 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 laughing about it in a jolly manner. Seuss's intelligence was always something that was sort of on a sliding scale. He was yeah. as dumb as he needed to be for the episode. We felt like as long as he's really dumb, he also has to be really sweet. Like, the dumber he is, the sweeter he has to be for you to forgive that. Yeah, you know? totally. Well, and, and that, that was the thing, too, where he, even he could... He still couldn't be that dumb... Because it, it's like, because you you always want to let the audience in on the fact that you have respect for their char the characters. Yeah. Oh, and we love Seuss. And yeah. I, honestly, I'm using dumb as a shorthand. Here. Yeah, totally. In my heart, I don't actually think of Seuss as being dumb. Yeah. Like I think of Seuss as being somebody who sort of lives in a bit of a fantasy world, who has a passionate love for things, and the border between sort of reality and his imagination is a little foggy. Yeah. Um. So it's like. It's, it's less that he's an idiot and more that he's, like, hyper-focused and invested in these strange, nerdy little things, which makes him not invested and focused in other things and screw up time to time. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a line in, later in the episode where Seuss is like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of screw up and I'm not always as charming as it, th you know, as it think. Uh, or it's not always as charming as I think I think it is. And it's like, which, which is a nice balance to show that, like, he's self-aware a little bit. Like, he, he, he doesn't. He's not. He's not a dummy. He knows what's going on. A, no, a little bit of self awareness, uh, you know, a kind heart, you know, I think can forgive a lot. Um, this idea, we're always searching for visual ways to set up story pieces, and this is something where we work backwards. The idea of the sweater that the pig is wearing—that just came from we're following this pterodactyl into the forest, but we can't actually follow him. We need a trail. What if there's yarn? If there's yarn, there's a sweater. Like, we, we work backwards from those things yeah. to create. And I thought that was a really successful idea that they're following the yarn um, to get there. Um, these are some great, great BG paintings. I think Ellie Mihalka uh, did, did, did that color on those. Um, and McG McGucket. We brought <laughs> McGucket along on this episode. Um, mainly, we wanted, we'd already done a monster hunt. This is our second monster hunt. So our yeah. first monster hunt was Gobble Wonker, and we felt like that episode maybe wasn't as strong as some of the others based on the fact that the stakes didn't feel super high. And so we wanted to ratchet up the stakes on this one, both yeah. personally and also believe that the danger was real. So we thought, well, what if we bring McGucket along, we can have the monster eat McGucket, yeah. <laughs> and then we can genuinely make you scared for these characters. Yeah. Cause, cause that's the thing that's hard in a kid show to, to, cause like when you're watching it, you're like, you know, what are they gonna kill Mabel at They're the end of the episode? Fine. Everyone's, gonna, everyone's be gonna be fine. You have to create the illusion of stakes and suspense. Yeah. Uh, St Stan's reaction to this place and his decision that he was gonna call it Jurassic Sapper <laughs> is very, very in character. Good idea, bad title, bad execution. <laughs> Kristen does a great job of grabbing yeah. this performance. Totally. Like, Mabel really means it here. Like, she, she forgives a lot with Stan, but, like, Waddles sort of represents, like, the purity of her deepest love. And the yeah. idea that Stan would threaten that is genuinely a shock to Mabel. This is... Seuss unraveling this... Uh, is probably his most unforgivable moment in this. <laughs> this is the episode where I feel what Dipper feels, where I'm like, Zeus! Yeah, totally. <laughs> but we, we, I, we felt like we needed it to ramp up their story and to raise the stakes of just how dangerous things were. Yeah, because we, we found like even in, even in B stories, if there wasn't some kind of emotional stakes, they would just be boring and, and wouldn't an escalation. care. Yeah, unless unless you actually had the characters get to a point where they had real conflict with each other, it just felt like a waste of time. You're watching it, and you're like, I don't care about this. Um, and and you know, like the pterodactyl bros is like a visual symbol for their friendship, and and you know, Dipper's like rejecting it and stuff. I gotta give uh, Tim McKeown credit. He was one of the other writers on this episode, and sort of Seuss's journey and the pterodactyl bros and and how that fit together. I think a lot of those ideas came from him. Yeah, Tim had a lot of great ideas in this one. <laughs> and this is an this is an episode where it was like one of your like I was sort of I think I was filling in for Alex and James Baxter who was like the like one of the best animators alive 
like Alex somehow conned him into <laughs> into like uh, doing um, animation for this. Yeah, episode. okay, that like, shot that right there, shot, which is amazing, and that shot right there, this shot here. So let, let me explain. So um, this entire act was storyboarded by Alonzo. We talk about him all the time because he's such an amazing artist, and we didn't know how this was all going to look. And Alonzo did. Some of the best storyboards I've seen in my entire life, before or since, yep. for this episode. This and Emmy Award with, winning. Yes. <laughs> um, and Emmy Award. award and and th this this scene where they're all hiding behind, like the way they're posing, they're acting, but in particular the way that Alonzo drew this pterodactyl. It felt mm -hmm. real. It felt tactile. It thought like a bird. It was yeah. so good. And, you know, when, it, when the animation first came back from overseas, there was so much subtlety in Alonzo's animation. And the first pass of animation... You know, um, the, the teams always do a good job, but it didn't have that real re yeah. reality to it anymore. And we were actually, we were pretty disappointed when we saw the animation because, you know, Alonzo was doing feature quality storyboarding. Yep. And what we were getting was, you know, television quality animation, but we knew it could yeah, be stronger. Yeah, done in a time crunch. And, um, and James Baxter, who, as uh, Mike said, is one of the, literally one of the best animators in the world. He's he animated, uh, what, Simba in The Lion King? Uh, like or the, Mufasa? The um, uh, Quasimodo and Hunchback in Notre Dame. There's all these, like, three... The, he like he, His brain is like a 3D camera. He can draw anything at any angle. Yeah, like he's, a, a, he's a living legend. Yeah. Um, and we, we knew him through some friends. And he was friends with, uh, with Eric Fountain, who's one of our artists. Um, and he did some animation for our theme song. And I basically begged him, can you reanimate a couple of the shots of this pterodactyl? Because... Like, you know, it's 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 feature quality storyboarding and we want some feature quality animation. And yeah. he being a fan of the show, he basically did it for cheap, you know, just because he he also loves 2D animation, doesn't get to do it that much. anymore. Yeah. You know, he's working at DreamWorks at the time doing a lot of CG animation. And here he is, somebody who's got a skill that no one else on Earth can do and he rarely gets to use it. So he was actually excited for a chance to do it. Yeah, and, and I was, like, super new to doing anything, and he did this, like, pass of the dinosaur, and all of the animation was beautiful, but I was like, oh, maybe it's not fast enough. And I, ha I was in this, like, horrible position of giving the best animator in the world notes. <laughs> <laughs> Which feels insane. Yeah, I was, like, I was like, could it be a little faster? And he's like, I'm James Baxter. <laughs> he didn't say that. He had an awesome attitude. I got to call out that pose right there. This sequence also boarded by Alonzo. And that pose of Waddles turning his head around and looking at Stan, probably the cutest drawing in the whole series. Yeah. And I just saw someone get a tattoo of that that drawing because it's so It's the best. Cute. It's adorable. It's something because sometimes the storyboards are so good you call out them to the overseas studio. Like you trace this drawing. Yeah. Use this exact and drawing. And I'm glad that they traced it. Um, this is a... Uh, this is... I think we were talking um, in another episode just about how we have a lot of ep episodes where Stan starts out as a jerk and then reveals <laughs> his heart of gold, and it always works. Like, to me, this is a very emotionally satisfying yeah. turn. Like, that Stan is Stan has gone from being a total coward, James Baxter again, to yeah. literally fighting this monster for, for Mabel. Um, it just makes me love Stan. Like, to me, this is yeah. one of his sweetest, best moments in the whole series. <laughs> I love that he re gets re swallowed. Um, well, and th this is like, you know, I, I, I feel like on these commentary tracks that we've been like, oh, this was hard and this was hard. But this is one of those really rewarding ones because I feel like this, we took this structure that we were trying to get at in Gobble Wonker and we did a like way better job of yeah. it. And like, all the elements of the of the series were like coming on all fours. Like the boarding was great, the animation is great. You know, the writing got a lot better. When well, we understand um, these characters more, we're more invested in them. Yeah. Um, and so you know, Stan Stan fishing is is nice, but Stan saving models is so much nicer. Uh, this was a, a scene that in script I didn't know if it would work, and Alonzo figured it out. Like he figured out a visual way to show that this creature can't see. Yeah. Um, and I think I think Eric Fountain boarded this little part here. Um, yeah, and I think this was like Tim's idea or Eric's idea or something. It was it was like an idea that sounded crazy. It was, it, yeah, but it worked. Yeah, it it looks super cool, and Seuss gets to be a hero as well. Um, speaking of James Baxter, who did so much of this great animation, uh, uh, if are any Adventure Time fans are listening, uh, Penn Ward, also a friend and fan of James, loved James's animation so much that he created an episode and a character called James Baxter the horse. <laughs> he's now a reoccurring character, a horse on a beach ball, just saying, James Baxter! And that's James's voice, and James animated it. Like Both of us created things in our shows as an excuse to work with him um, and to hope that he would work with us. Oh, yes! Oh, Mr. Fine, you're okay! Uh, and this, uh, like, I love the like little 
him making Waddle's wave, you know, stuff yeah. like that. That's not in the script. Like that's the yeah. storyboard artist bringing these characters to life, making them sweeter and more lovable than we could imagine. Yeah, and like something that's about, a James shot. Yeah, it's <laughs> incredible. Um, <laughs> hey, James, I got a couple notes. That's Just a, kidding. That's a James shot. <laughs> like when you frame by frame it, and every single drawing is beautiful. That's how you know it's yeah, James. Totally, he's incredible. And even just like just those back, like uh, uh, the 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 background team is really humming too. Just some of these backgrounds are really incredible. Um, this idea, we knew Seuss needed to yell some dramatic thing here, and for ninety nine percent of the episode, he sell, he used to yell, "Insert dramatic line here," <laughs> um, because we didn't like the Bros Before Dinos thing was added at the last second for a setup and a payoff. Yeah, that's like one of those things where you you know you've got like ten minutes left, and we're like, uh. Bros before dinos. Uh, maybe it's um. Uh, hey, it's Dino time. Uh, hey, it's Jurassic. Dino time. Wow. Uh, uh. <laughs> Stan in the coffin. There. That's another uh, like drawing ad lib by our, our artist Alonzo. Um, and so many people thought that that was some big foreshadowing about Stan's death. And there was all these theories that we had some big plan about killing Stan. It was literally just Alonzo being like, I thought it would be interesting there in the church. What if he had a near death experience? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I love how horrifying the voice acting is. Here. <laughs> it's like, it's like, are they gonna die? We we try to we, when we have sweet moments, we do try to button them with a joke so it doesn't start to get too corny. Um, and this dinosaur tooth, if you notice, wa watch the first episode of season two. That tooth is now hanging on a thread above Dipper's bed, and we we like the idea that they kept souvenirs from most of their adventures. Um, there's always something they're taking away with them. Uh, we also. We, we, we liked McGucket enough that we didn't want him to be actually dead. We had no idea what we were going to do with him in season two yet, but we, we, we had to bring him back. I think I don't think I came up with the line, I ate my way through a dinosaur. I think that was definitely a pitch from somebody else, and I was a little on the fence about it. But then as soon as I read it, I was like, nah, I got to keep it. That's oh, the funny. Spoon, the spoon's held. I ate my way through a dinosaur. Um, Bobby Renzabi there or, uh, uh, pitching pants, pants. Oh, your, your, your arms get, no, what was it? Arm pants? Do your arms yeah, get yeah, jealous yeah, of your legs? Yeah. Then you need arm pants, the pants <laughs> for your arms. Um, this is, if you can't think of something funny, think of something stupid.